So our topic today is surgical pearls and pitfalls in macular and submacular and optic nerve head surgeries. And our faculties are Dr. Rajesh Sahai, consultant, vitreotin consultant from Lucknow, Sekhar Eye Hospital, Dr. Vyas Saravaran, and Dr. George J. Manayat, vitreotin consultant from Arvinda Hospital, Coimbatore, then Dr. Naresh Babu, HOD and vitreotin consultant in Madurai, Arvinda Hospital, and uh, Dr. Suvanka Sipal is my colleague and uh, fellow vitreotin consultant from Priyamada Villa Arvinda Hospital. So let's start the presentation. First, my Dr. Rajesh Sahar, dealing with vitreomacular traction and epiretinal membrane. No, no, your presentation is here. Only. Where you put it? Shall I start? Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rabhijit and AIC for giving me this opportunity. And uh, thank you for a few audience that we have, other than the presenters. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, uh, VMT and AP retinal membranes. So skipping few slides. So vitreous is an encapsulated in a thin shell called the vitreous cortex. The cortex is in, in young, healthy eyes is usually sealed to the retina. In aging and other pathologic conditions, the vitreous cortex separates from the retina. That's known as the posterior vitreous detachment, as you, as you see in this video. And incomplete separation, uh, the anomalous PVD causes tractional anatomical damage. So the damages uh, because of the anomalous PVD could be vitreous kysis, VMT, ERM, CME, macular hole, exudative ARMD, or epiretinal proliferation, or L LHAP as it is known. And optic disaffects could be neovascularization, vitreous hemorrhage, and could be retinal tears in the periphery. The International Vitreomacular Tra uh, Traction Study Group identifies VMA, vitreomacular radiation, as partial separation of vitreous attached within three millimeter of the fovea. And uh, when the, uh, the traction causes anatomical changes in the configuration of the foveal surface, it is VMT. The natural history of VMT, it, uh, it was studied and found that 60% cases did not progress over three years. 20% resolved in 15 months with vision improvement. 12% developed macular hole. And when uh, the consequences and other details were explained to the patient, 8% elected early surgery, only on appearance of symptoms. So this uh, study concluded that uh, vitreo macular traction syndrome persists without visual deterioration unless macular hole develops. The indications for intervention is visual disturbances, decreased acuity, metamorphopsia, scotoma, etc. And this the graph here shows that early intervention, you know, restores better visual function. The treatment for tractional macular edema uh, could be gas, you know, it can be done with gas injection. And 25% uh, of the cases, uh, there'll be induction of PVD. And uh, it varies, now it varies from 60% uh, to 100% uh, in few studies. These gas injections can induce PVD in such cases. Ocriplasmin can be used for pharmacological vitrolysis and approximately 26-27%. Uh, in 28 days, and it is better in uh, young phakics without ERM and attachments less than 1500 microns. There it has been found uh, effective. The surgical treatment is the mainstay in present day and perform with or without ILM removal. Uh, coming to epiretinal membranes, uh, the, uh, also known as premacular fibroplasia, macular pucker, cellophane maculopathy, premacular glasses, 
and it's the cel cellular proliferation on the inner retinal surface and it's classified as idiopathic secondary or iatrogenic. The overall prevalence is 7 to 12 percent, 31 percent is bilateral, 16.8 percent uh, uh, increase in uh, epiretinal membranes, uh, the prevalence of epiretinal membranes after cataract surgery, 25 percent increases after CRVO. These are all uh, shown in Weber Dam and Blue Mountain studies. The peak age is 70 to 79 years and it was seen more common in women. Uh, we all know about the pathogenesis. The grading is 0, 1 and 2. Uh, the grade 2 is opaque membrane obscuring the underlying vessels and marked retinal distortion. The OCT is a handy tool for macular evaluation and documentation. ERMs are hyperreflective, irregular layer on the retinal surface. Provides structural details of increased CFT, thickened outer retina, disruption of uh, ellipsoid zone, etc. And outer layer disorganizations are mark markers of poor outcome. There's a new uh, software module in SSOCT and allows us to see transverse images alongside the usual longitudinal scan. This is, uh, you know, it gives a wholesome idea of the, uh, the, the presence of ERM. The management is pass plana uh, vitrectomy and ERM peeling. Uh, pass plana vitrectomy and ERM or ILM peeling. You can combine ERM with ILM. There are uh, studies to show uh, there, there has not been many randomized trials, many anecdotal reports though. The meta-analysis of seven RCT on the effects of ILM peel for idiopathic ERM, it showed ILM peeling is associated with increased CMT at 12 months. There are lesser recurrences in ERM and ILM peeling. ERM and ILM peel was associated with decreased light sensitivity and ERG changes, but this was initial. And despite structural changes, both approaches had comparable vision. The conclusion could be that ILM peeling is for long-term benefits. Uh, the complications of ILM peeling are minor retinal edema and hemorrhages, paracentral scotomas, hydrogenic punctate chorioretinopathy, that's because of the mechanical trauma and dissociated optic nerve fiber layer on uh, blue filter. Selective reduction B wave amplitudes on macular ERG. There's another condition uh, uh, known as epiretinal proliferation, also known as LHEP. This is a thick membrane, dense, it is a dense epiretinal membrane, lamellar hole associated epiretinal proliferation. These are the other nomenclature for the same condition. In 2020, it was identified with uh, ARMD, vein occlusion, DR, high myopia, and refractive CME. Initially, it was reported with uh, lamellar holes. So, but now it is with other, it's seen with other conditions. That is why it is now known as epiretinal proliferation. SDOCT shows an isoreflective space filling material over the retina without any tractional properties. Whereas ERM is hyperreflective, irregular space between it and retina cause traction and stria. And no surgical indication can be, the, the, uh, as such, there is no surgical indi indication can be removed in surgeries for pathologies like uh, full thickness macular holes lamellar macular holes or ERMs. So this was one case. Uh, you can see the, the isodense membrane covering it. And then this is post-surgery after one month. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rajesh. <coughs> so uh, shall we discuss anything if we have anything to ask or we Two, two topics together we take it. Yeah. Well, that's a yes. please. The success rate, uh, even from the company trials, was only twenty eight percent. So not even one in uh, three, so the less than one in three. Plus they tried to enhance the efficacy by injecting a double dose. So that led to zonal analysis and le uh, lens dislocation or dropping and all those things. So the efficacy as for single injection is very poor. Double injection, a lot of complications is there. Right now the role of Jetria is uh, not very clearly defined. Some people have tried as a adjunct for uh, vitrectomy in pediatric RVs as well as diabetic retinopathy, PDR cases. 
short series saying that it helps but I, again uh, all this role of current it's totally uh, not clear now probably it is not popular at all like apne is dead actually uh, something like that okay <laughs> it never launched it never launched because even the us trials it was so uh, poor results that uh, they themselves were not using it and the efficacy uh, in uh, patients who have no vmt is slightly better than around 35 in vmt it even drops less than 25% so when there is a tight vitreoretinal adhesion the chance of it uh, releasing that adhesion is very poor cost yeah mm, definitely definitely thank you so we go to the, our next topic different modalities for macular holes of uh, different sizes and in retinal detachment so this is the history was first described by nap in 1869 and modern concept and classification we follow mostly by gas and uh, the prevalence varies from 3.3% outside to 1.7% in india and bilateral case can happen in 11.1% of these cases so diagnosis we do by uh, clinically cd lamp biomicroscopy and now mostly oct to corroborate and the classification of the macular hole i'm not going to too much details basically stage 0 1a 1b uh, stage 2 3 and 4 and this is a classification of commonly used full thickness macular hole so this is a stage 2 is small hole a small or medium ftm age full thickness macular hole with vitreo macular traction stage 3 is large hole medium or large full thickness macular hole with vitreo macular traction stage 4 full thickness macular hole with pvd This is small, medium, or large full thickness macular hole without vitreous macular traction. Her PVD is already there. So this is the photos of impending macular hole and prognostic indicators of macular hole. So usually the most important indicator it is said that the size of macular hole and the minimum hole diameter is the most important prognostic indicator. Then there are also reports about duration. and morphology and thickness of foveal photoreceptor layers then defect in interdigitation zone extra limiting membrane or ellipsoid zone and then also there are hole forming factors uh, then macular hole index then traxoma hole index also some compressed aerial designing software is there we use uh, different dyes like trypsinone indosanin green and trypan blue nowadays we all of us mostly use brilliant blue dye so there are few videos which we can see and then discuss this is the old time 23 gauge surgeries this is the post retinal detachment surgery with silicon oil then we took out the oil the age of the uh, child was 9 years old and there's a one eyed child she was operated for a giant retinal tear we can see the laser marks there and uh, is a pretty big size hole <coughs> so but the posterior pole was little bit of boggy and uh, we can see the attachment is also quite tenacious unlike the normal eye So this is the papillomacular bundle ILM is still there, and we put PFCL to stabilize because uh, that area we don't want any atrophic trauma, and so after another PFCL is much easier to kill that ILM, and then we take out the PFCL and normal fluid exchange with gas.
This is a patient of inverse flap technique, both eyes pseudophagic, 660 and 66 vision. You can see this is a stage 4 macular hole and this is a 25 gauge surgery we did. So after the induction of the PVD, stained with green and blue dye and uh, picked up the temporal ILM. And we just trimmed it. And we did not try to put it inside basically. We did a fluid air exchange slightly with some uh, patients. So we can see that it will automatically be all around that hole only. And we should be careful that that flap should not come inside that extrusion cannula. So all of your trouble is gone then. So that is the result. And this is one of the case which is a bad traumatic macular hole. You can see the papillomacular macular bundle retina is non-existent like that. And uh, here also phenicillin I used because not much elements also there. So I could not peel also from the inferior part and inside the arcade bad scar and uh, managed to put that ILM flaps and it trimmed the flap and then we did the fluid exchange so that the flap goes over to the hole covering the hole. You don't have to put it inside basically, just covering this enough and see nicely healed in the hole. And uh, you can see it is closed. The outer tissue was there and the vision improved also. And this is one of the nowadays, you can say less of the trouble we are taking because it decreased our timings for macular surgery nowadays with this flap so we just take out the temporal thing and uh, so this is the before and after surgery so this is the last one with the detachment macular hole surgery and uh, of course I usually feel with the PFCL uh, another PFCL but lots of people feels in detached retina also and there is a retinotomy I did and then uh, few of the holes are already there, the bricks. Stain it and uh, under PFCL I think it's much more easier to peel. Not a problem at all. In fact nowadays under PFCL also sometimes uh, you can put the flap back inside the hole. The result is equally good. So that was the final OCT came. Thank you and that's all. So shall I, yeah, shall I call you? So Dr. Norris Babu sir with submacular hemorrhage and scar, pulse and pitfalls of surgical management. It is there or not? Check. Right. <coughs> Krishna, take a photo, nice photo.
yeah yeah i put it is there yeah is there uh good morning all thank you for coming you have got a very nice uh, this thing so uh for want of time i think we'll skip uh, most of the uh, the slides and we'll go for the video directly so mac managing some, i what you call this submacular hemorrhage is a real challenge and with a uh, lot of pcbs coming around nowadays we used to come across a lot of uh, the uh, submacular hemorrhage <coughs> so it is basically the presence of uh, the uh, blood in the potential space between the rt and the neurosensory retina so we have come across this submacular hemorrhage and the scar in lot of cases commonly in amd or nowadays very common in pcb high myopia trauma everything and in fact in case of uh, ram also we used to come across these things and uh, uh, very rarely we can have uh, valsalva but usually it causes subilem bleed for which we do a hyaluronotomy and uh, uh, it uh, clears any subretinal hemorrhage has to be uh, evacuated within 24 hours because otherwise these are the three mechanisms by which the damage starts happening so when we come across submacular hemorrhage earlier the intervention better the outcome and uh, it's graded based on the size and the thickness into mild moderate and severe but whatever the grade may be it's better to the uh, what you call uh, treat but prognosticating it <coughs> depends on these factors basically if the hemorrhage is less than 2 weeks then the outcome is usually good but poor prognosis is associated with uh, longer duration hemorrhage thick hemorrhages and uh, if it is a uh, thick at the fovea so we have got lot of options most commonly which we use is uh, the gas and uh, <coughs> the tpa so this is a case of a traumatic uh, what you call a sub subretinal hemorrhage you can find a indirect choroidal scar fortunately temporal to the fovea with hemorrhage in this case we have just injected the gas after the gas injection over a period of time you can see the evacuation of the blood and the scar i mean scarring i mean we can see that uh, choroidal rupture temporally so patient may not be having good vision but still retrieving the vision is uh, good but the surgery is usually a fun i'll uh, skip other surgeries so we'll go for this surgery uh, can you reduce the volume can you can you reduce the volume of this yeah yeah so so recently we ca came across a case uh, with a thick uh, macular scar submacular scar the problem with the submacular scar is the scar is usually very thick chewy we have tried almost all the instruments previously we used to have 20 gauge when we operate with the 20 gauge it's it was somewhat uh, easy to <coughs> it was uh, easy to chew you can see in the ultrasound there is a vitreous hemorrhage and there is a scar in the so it was a planned uh, two stage surgery and we have planned for submacular surgery also you can see the coffee colored blood and you can see the dense scar under the fovea so we have to remove this to do this we induce the retinal detachment and retinal detachment is uh, induced by injecting the balance salt solution filled in a silicon oil injector mechanized injection it is more controlled in three or four places in the subretinal space when we inject the de retina detaches after fluid air exchange once the bubble squalesces it's easy for us to do a peripheral retinectomy so usually we do 180 degree peripheral retinectomy and with the help of tano serpinus tube whichever we have or whichever we are comfortable with roll the retina to the nasal side and we can make out two things in this one is the submacular hemorrhage was there that was inferior to the scar and there was a thick uh, dense submacular uh, i mean uh, uh, scar so we can make out there is a scar under the fovea and the hemorrhage inferior to the scar so we removed both with the help of the forceps so we can make out that is a hemorrhage which can be usually cut with the cutter and uh, removed but many a times the cutter gets clogged 
often we have to clear it and this is a submacular scar you can see it's quite dense chewy rubbery so this is very difficult to uh, remove sometimes we make a sclerostomy to remove this but what is happening So these are all past experiences. We have used cutter, we have used pragmatome, what not to remove. So this is uh, some case which was done in the past where I am using the frag, I mean the forceps and then the pragmatome. It was so difficult for us to remove this uh, thing. So finally, after cutting it into multiple pieces, literally it was uh, removed like a foreign body. Sorry for the poor quality, this was done a long time back. <coughs> so this is another case actually. So what we have done in this case is after removing the scar, uh, because there was no RP, RP grafting was done. So we can make out the RP graft which was gently pulled uh, under the fovea. So the graft was placed. Now what to do with this uh, scar? So what we have done in this case in order to save the time and our mood, everything. So what usually I do nowadays is take the scar. We have uh, done a harvest of uh, RP graft. In that graft area, just put this scar. So if you are not able to remove it, just uh, bury it. So in the area where I have uh, removed the RP for the grafting in that area, I just keep the scar, then inject PFCL. Okay, so it is a stage surgery as I was telling. So for next uh, 10 days, this PFCL will be there staying inside the eye. Over that, uh, we top up with the P I mean, silicon oil. So you can see, this is the end of the first stage. So this gives good uh, reattachment of the retina. Once it is done, we go for the second stage. I usually do the laser in the second stage because the courier retinal addition is uh, uh, much easier. So this is uh, the second stage of the same patient done after 10 days. We have removed the silicon oil, then we have to remove the PFCL also. Once it is done, we go for the laser. <coughs> so that, uh, what do you call 180 degree retinectomy, which retinotomy we have done, retinectomy, that has to be treated like a giant retinal tear and maybe some barraging around the graft also. You can see the a scar sitting over the graft area. So we have barraged and now it is filled with the silicon oil. So once it is done, it is filled with the silicon oil and there is uh, the sub, I mean, uh, graft in the subfoveal area. So usually we use uh, 1000 silicon oil or sometimes 2000 silicon oil and uh, the removal is regular. Maybe at the end of third month we remove it. Yeah, so this is 15th post update. You can find the graft and here you can see the, uh, the scar sitting in the area where we have grafted. So this is one of the newest thing which we have started doing because uh, removing the scar is very difficult. So we have got all the other options like uh, you can inject just gas and leave it. Once the blood gets evacuated, we can remove. Or other shortest way is just uh, put this graft under the, the, the area where we have uh, harvested. If we have not harvested also, it doesn't matter. Just keep it over the RP and then cover it with the retina and laser it. Never we had any problem so far. So I think with that, I would like to conclude the talk. Thank you very much. Oh. No, this uh, case has got a uh, very short follow-up. Maybe around 660 is the vision. Previously, it was hand moments, maybe because of vitreous hemorrhage. But uh, people claim very, I mean, tall in the sense after the RP graft, they get good vision. This is a single-eyed patient. But for a single-eyed patient, 660 is... Uh, yeah, fine, but usually they don't go beyond 636, at least in my experience. Like, how do you decide what to do, like a plain gas, TPA with gas, or sub submacular surgery? No, if there is a fluid blood on the retina and the retina is detached, usually what I do is you, I make a retinotomy peripherally, inject PFCL alone, leave it. So over a period of time in a supine position, most of the blood comes into the 
which has cavity and in fact it fills the AC also. Maybe after three, four days, we go inside, remove it and then go for the gas. If the retina is already detached with subretinal bleed. But in these cases, like wherever there is a scar under the macula, we go for a complete uh, 180 degree retinectomy and uh, remove the scar. Most of the time, RP graft. And uh, uh, if the scar is very thick, just bury it. No? Never, never. Because uh, this uh, heavy fluid is so good, it really reattaches. I was telling, like I do the laser also in the second sitting. Even for giant turtle tear, we do this. At the end of 10th day, we remove the PFCL, laser it, just fill it with the gas and leave it. So it, uh, in fact, one of the advantage of using this, uh, this PFCL is the retina never uh, slips down. Yeah. <coughs> so after this DRT you created, then you leave uh, in the second stage you put oil or gas second stage in this case oil okay but in uh, giant retinal tear per se gas in the second okay. stage giant retinal tear also i heard that you would do in two stages correct two stages yeah, most yeah. of the cases we do two stages thank you yes so our next speaker uh, dr saravan here <coughs> macular hole and skysis Thanks, Subjit. Uh, I'll be leading, uh, uh, talking about a few of the miscellaneous uh, topics which are not covered in the main uh, list. So, uh, myopic traction maculopathy, initially when we were, uh, before the pre-OCT era, we were not able to identify the uh, uh, tissues uh, uh, just getting distorted in the posterior pole. So, but after the OCT came, you can see that in the first picture, you can see in the right here, you can just see the stiffness of the skytic posterior vitreous. You can see the early traction maculopathy where the inner layers are getting uh, uh, pulled up. And a little bit more uh, severe case, in another case, you can see the early uh, sky, skytic spaces here. Here you can see the early skytic spaces and this is the stiff uh, posterior hyaloid, skytic posterior hyaloid, which is the main uh, pathological factor which causes all these changes. Here you can see an inner lamellar hole and here you can see a full thickness macular hole with a posterior pole detachment. And whenever you have a posterior pole detachment in a staphylomatous in the eye, it is usually because of the myoptic because it's very unusual for a macular hole to cause a retinal detachment in a normal patient. It only happens in a high myoptic patients. And you can see at the base of the hole, you can see the presence of a myopic macular skysis. This is, some of, this is the uh, uh, most severe stage of uh, myopic traction maculopathy. So initially, even though multiple names were uh, uh, given to this entity, Right now, uh, myopic trapkin maculopathy is the most preferred and accepted uh, terminology which is currently uh, uh, being used everywhere. And here you can see one more case where there's a secondary CMBM along with the presence of uh, very severe uh, macular, myopic macular skysis. And you can, see, you can even see a small dome-shaped macula which also is common in patients with high myopia. The central macula sorts of juts in causing a dome-shaped macula, uh, macula. So this can also produce uh, uh, complications like serous maculopathy. Uh, like CSR, like a CRS maculopathy. Again, showing a severe uh, skysis in inferior to the uh, macula here, fovea here. So uh, the pathogenesis, why it happens is because of the uh, stiffening of the ILM, the, uh, the non-redundance of the retina, atrophy of the RP and choroid causing uh, loss of that uh, negative traction, uh, suction force, an incomplete PPD and the skytic vitreous. So uh, all, and all these stiff vessels also, all these have been uh, uh, suggested as a cause of this myopic traction maculopathy. So uh, when, uh, when ILM uh, was sent for uh, histopathological uh, evaluation, they showed that the collagen fiber and cell debris were identified in inner surface ILM uh, in most of the case of MTM, which is uh, than normal patients. So first, uh, what, what they tried was uh, routine vitrectomy with or without gas. And uh, so this was one of the first, uh, uh, with ILM peel, uh, this was the first uh, uh, described for the treatment for this uh, entity. And you can see from the uh, published article, the response to vitrectomy with ILM peel. You can see the resolution of the uh, skysis as well as uh, the uh, closure of the macular hole. One more case, sometimes if there's a large uh, subfoveal detachment in the absence of any break, uh, the fluid can take a lo lo long time to uh, resolve because of the uh, absence of uh, healthy RP, the pumping mechanism is not that very great and it takes a long time for the fluid to come down. So just showing a small uh, case of, uh, short case of uh, video of uh, 
myopic uh, uh, macular hole here. You can see the loss of contrast because of the uh, atrophy of the RP in the posterior pole. So identifying the ILM is not very easy. So I am using it because of the uh, fluid also was there as a rocal, focal RD in the macular posterior pole. So I put PFCL also, stained it with now tripan blue. And you can see that when I am trying to remove the ILM, what I removed first was the skytic vitreous. You can see the uh, rubbery uh, 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 consistency of the first tissue. This is actually the skytic vitreous, which is not identified. Nowadays, people use tramsinone to identify this mem membrane. Now, second time, what I am doing is the ILM. So, using PFCL helps to prevent the dye migrating into the subfovial space in the case of post pole detachment. So, this is a short video of how to do ILM pinning. And using contact lenses also gives a much better depth perception compared to routine and non-contact viewing systems. So then Richard Spade, he described where he identified using Tramsinone, he identified the posterior hyaloid and removed the posterior hyaloid and the ischitic vitreous, but he did not do ILM peeling. So he showed that even without ILM peeling, with proper removal of the vitreous, you can reattach these cases. So next uh, choice is to push, instead of uh, pull, uh, push the retina from inside, push the sclera from outside, a lot of myopic uh, macular buckles have been tried. The uh, most popular is Andoplob and the JBL buckle. So in India, a lot of the T buckle, this is what we in India because it's quite cheap, around 3,000, 4,000 rupees, but it's a little bit more gruesome. The orbital inflammation post orbital is very uh, severe. This is just a small uh, video of uh, the JBL buckle uh, being placed. Uh, so just to uh, expose the uh, temporal area, the uh, superior, inferior, and the lateral rectus, and then do the ILM peel. So once you finish the ILM peel, then this is the uh, uh, andosplom actually. So they put a light pipe to uh, assist in correct positioning. This is just pushed underneath the uh, temporal uh, rectus, uh, lateral rectus. And the light shows the positioning of the buckles in correct situation. And then you can just suture it. And uh, this is the uh, post-op uh, resolution of the, I can see the closure of the uh, hole and the resolution of macular schisis following the placement of andoplom and you will be changing refraction because the sclera is pushed forward so you may have to change your glasses also. So this is how uh, various techniques for treating uh, myopic uh, um, traction maculopathy. Then we will come to the second topic that is the optic disc pit maculopathy. This is a little bit of a rare entity not seen com commonly and this is uh, one of the uh, congenital anomalies of the disc include which comes under the uh, optic disc coloboma, morning glory syndrome and all those things it comes under the same scheme. So here you can see that the fluid accumulation happens in both the intraretinal and the subretinal space and along with the uh, changes in the RP also. So where this fluid comes from, how it enters the uh, subretinal space or the intraretinal space is again a question. But the most accepted theory is that because of the defect in the uh, optic disc uh, and crebrosa, the vitreous skytic fluid enters through the uh, pit into the uh, intraretinal and subretinal spaces. So you can see uh, unlike CSR, uh, you see intraretinal uh, skysis or uh, fluid accumulation in the intraretinal apart from the subretinal space also. So various techniques tried for this entity is first they tried a barrage laser to the pit, uh, just temple to the uh, uh, pit area, either two uh, overlapping rows uh, to prevent the fluid migration into the subfovial space. This only uh, takes uh, 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 scar or if, or if the peripapillary area is still attached. The peripapillary area is detached, then this is not going to get uh, have any effect. So next was uh, people have tried plain gas injection without vitrectomy, like a pneumatic displacement, which you do for uh, submacular blood. Then people have tried vitrectomy with uh, ILM peel or without uh, ILM peel and also gas injection. So all these techniques have been were initially tried with a limited success. Barrage, plain gas, vitrectomy with gas, vitrectomy with ILM with gas. Then Spade et al. he described inner retinal fenestrations. He, he, he pr proposed that by creating a partial thickness uh, uh, injury to the uh, peripapillary pre area by a sharp needle, the fluid which enters through the optic pit exits back into the vitreous cavity. So his theory was uh, that you can just redirect the fluid back into the vitreous cavity by creating inner retinal fenestrations. He showed some cases which succeeding with this th technique, but uh, we tried and we could not have the same success. So right now what is the most popular is plugging of the pit by various uh, tissues uh, like some people have used fibrin sealant, some people autologous blood, some people have used uh, scleral flap and also ILM. This is one case of uh, ILM peel uh, uh, for uh, a macular pit. You can see that uh, here they did a fovea involving ILM peel. So the risk of fovea involving ILM peel is that 
when you do that if it's the peri- foveal uh, ret- area is very thin it can produce a iatrogenic macular hole formation which happen so you just uh, peel all the ilm and then uh, under air you just plug it into the optic disc pit you can see that uh, even though the srf resolved it, it produce a secondary macular hole so nowadays what we do is more of a uh, fovea sparing ilm peel so there's a kid with a hole so you can see that the ilm peel is uh, started nasal to the fovea so that the fovea itself is spared and then you peel the flaps and then under air you just uh, push it into the optic pit so this is the ilm uh, peeling technique now which is much more successful than ilm peel is the scleral plug technique so you take a auto, uh, say a autograph from the, peri- uh, in the from the pa- same patient trim it according to the size the whole size whatever optic disc pit the size you see and then just slightly push it into do a vitrectomy ilm peeling may not be needed in these cases i don't usually do ilm peeling in this case where i am going for a scleral graft and then push the graft into the pit area so this goes and plugs and this is the uh, oct showing the uh, pre and uh, post resolution of the graft you can see the graft sitting on the optic disc pit last is the uh, unusual or uh, inadvertent uh, migration of subretinal pfcl in patients who have undergone uh, uh, red, uh, rd surgery here because of the uh, bubbling uh, when you have in you know, exchanging instruments uh, because of the jet force of the uh, infusion fluid the pfcl bubbles breaks into small small uh, bubbles which can migrate in under the breaks and uh, go into the go into the uh, subretinal space so what we can do here is uh, some there are two three techniques which we can do uh, one is uh, what uh, the uh, if it's a very small bubble and you don't want to injure the macula uh, create a hydrogenic macula hole so what you can do is you can create a, a small a blob of rd use uh, at the posterior pole by using the either the 40 gauge needle or uh, as dr avijesh taught me i use the 30 gauge needle also then you can uh, push this uh, subfoveal uh, uh, blob of uh, pfcl into the peripheral area and then as you aspirate the subretinal fluid the uh, pfcl bubble also gets r- removed this is one technique when the bubble is very small so you can see that this is uh, what dr abhijit taught me you can see that i am breaking the 30 gauge needle which used routinely used for intravitreal injections and hooking it onto a routine intramuscular 24 gauge needle and creating a, our own contraption this is a little bit uh, cumbersome but if you have the 40 gauge needle uh, which is much more easier to use but in case you don't have access to that and, and, and at the ot if you don't have this you can use it as a backup uh, tool so this is then connected to either a silicon injector filled with bss or you can use your ask your nurse to inject through a 1 cc syringe so this is a second post of it is best to remove the pfcl as early as possible because it can cause permanent phototoxic uh, phototoxic effect so the oil is still inside this in this patient i'm just uh, uh, bending uh, and making this parallel to the rp at the level of the macula the needle should be bent according to the uh, curvature of the globe and then once you inject it will form a small web of uh, rd bs is injected under the retina and then you aspirate this either you're using a 25 gauge uh, suction cannula or a 27 gauge suction cannula, whichever you have access to before that we we'll just mobilize the pfc so it's loose and easily asp- as- aspiratable so once you do that then once you aspirate the sub submacula fluid the pfc also gets removed along with it so this uh, break need not be lasered but because of the one night patient i just wanted to make sure it doesn't go for a rd second technique is when you have a large bubble you can make a nick at the edge of the base of the bubble and directly aspirate using the either the 40 gauge needle or a 27 gauge soft tip which i am using in this case so is a pediatric patient who has got a large bubble there so first is using a, uh, creating a small nick with the 27 gauge needle there and then using directly the you can do this directly with your 40 gauge needle also then i'm using a 27 gauge suction suction cannula to aspirate this uh, uh, sub foveal pfcl last technique is you need not remove it you create a, a inferior uh, blob of uh, uh, rd by injecting with sub submacula bss and then push the uh, pfc bubble into the lower part of the macula and ask the patient to maintain uh, maintain sitting position post operatively so that the bubble migrates out of the fovea into the inferior macula so this also is one technique which has been tried thank you i'll stop here so i will call dr subankar sipal to and we have to keep it short because now we are running short of time
good morning good morning uh, my topic is uh, submacular hemorrhage causes and its role of uh, tpa gas and anti vegf and dr narish babu has already discussed few of my uh, uh, slides so i'll just skip through so it's a hemorrhage in the potential space between the neurosensory retina and the rpe most common cause is neovascular amd pcv retinal artery macroaneurysm trauma myopia and angioid streaks the it may lead to the photoreceptor damage within 24 hours by causing shearing of outer segment of photoreceptors impaired transport of nutrients direct toxicity by iron fibrin and hemosiderin so timely intervention is required so treatment options are like anti vegf uh, monotherapy pneumatic displacement with anti vegf intravitreal uh, tpa with anti vegf and pneumatic displacement then parse plana vitrectomy with subretinal tpa with subretinal or intravitreal pneumatic displacement natural history has a poor visual outcome there is no gold standard treatment and monotherapy with anti vegf showed some success anti vegf treats the underlying pathology the expansel gas like c3fa resepsis causes mechanical displacement of the blood from the fovea the faster visual recovery and uh, it may cause also flattening of hemorrhagic peds so uh, it also allows uh, to view the underlying pathology and perform uh, related investigations and treatment anti vegf with gas has shown some better result but there is no head to head prospective trial a cat trial group subgroup of submacular hemorrhage had favorable outcome tpa was first described by wilson harriot the intravitreal uh, 0.1 ml the dose is 50 microgram in 0.1 ml it catalyzes the breakdown of plasminogen to plasmin to cause clot lysis liquefies subretinal clot and hasten resorption of pre existing hemorrhage so intravitreal tpa with or without gas or anti vegf result is very good in small hemorrhages with shorter duration subretinal tpa dose of uh, 10 microgram in 0.1 ml Uh, following a vitrectomy is used in the large uh, long standing and more severe form of hemorrhage it causes chemical lysis of clot with minimal mechanical trauma a few side effects may be photoreceptor cell loss rp pigmentary changes exudative retinal detachment or hemorrhage vitrectomy allows us that larger gas bubble for better tamponade there are some studies showing three line visual improvement uh, in 66% of the cases but there is no clear difference between vitrectomy subretinal tpa versus intravitreal tpa without vitrectomy it also has the advantage of giving uh, doing subretinal pneumatic displacement which exerts higher pressure more effective after uh, tpa assisted clot lysis and uh, advantage of vitrectomy prolong uh, face down positioning is not required and less chance of iop rise but there is some high risk of macular hole formation so vitrectomy with subretinal tpa with pf cell also has been used to displace subfoveal blood so here is a case of a 55 year old female with uh, 15 days history of uh, decrease in vision known hypertensive hypercholesterolemia having a left eye submacular hemorrhage she was treated first with uh, injection c3fa with uh, ranibizumab post injection vision improved to 6 by 18 but still there is persistent hemorrhage so injection tpa was given intravitreally one month post injection vision improved but still there was hemorrhage so uh, ffa was done showing a stipple uh, showing a hypofluorescence but uh, no definite leakage second dose of uh, ranibizumab was given the post injection also again c3 fa it was given because there was persistent hemorrhage so later on uh, icg was done which did not show any polyp or vvn so provisional diagnosis of a retinal artery macroneurysm or an amd was made and received three mo- three third dose of ranibizumab later on two more doses of ranibizumab patient received and vision was improved to 6 by 9 second case of a 75 year old lady who is known hypertensive having decrease in vision more than a month with f- finger counting at 1 meter FFA is showing a retinal artery macroneurysm, and uh, there was some macular uh, hemorrhage with uh, old, like altered uh, blood. So she was first treated with injection C3FA with uh, intravitreal TPA and uh, anti vegf, but there was not much of change. So injection C3FA was re-injected. 
uh, but uh, still there was uh, persistent hemorrhage so vitrectomy with subretinal tpa with uh, gas was given the videos I have the video here you can show it So we did a vitrectomy, so after the initial uh, vitrectomy, the tricot was used to see the PVD status, then uh, with a specialized cannula with uh, what Sir Varun Sir has described that we have given subretinal uh, TPA we injected. Hemostasis was secured and then fluid air exchange was done. This one. Go to the uh, presentation. Next slide. So following that uh, surgery, the Subsequently, patient received two more injection of Epivercept and vision improved to 6 by 18. Third case of a 73-year-old male with known diabetic, sudden decrease in vision with, uh, with finger counting vision and there was uh, with, uh, mild vitreous hemorrhage with huge submacular hemorrhage. Uh, FFA was done showing stippled uh, hyperfluorescence and ICG showed uh, multiple polyps uh, in the right eye. So, the, he was treated first with uh, anti vhf injection with gas intravitreally with the prone positioning. Post injection, there was uh, breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage with RPE rip. So, ultrasound also showed vitreous hemorrhage with the use of uh, retinal hemorrhage. So, parsplanar vitrectomy with gas was given with, followed by uh, injection anti vhf So, one month post op, uh, second injection patient received, but Vision did not improve, but uh, hemorrhage resolved. So if we see the three cases, vis uh, visual equity depend on the underlying pathology. TPA was not uh, mandatory. So visual prognosis was better in patient with shorter duration and lesser retinal damage. Anatomical success could be achieved. Subretinal TPA was very effective in long-standing cases after the intravitreal uh, TPA failed. So relatively less complication. Only only one case had a breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage with RPE rip. So then to conclude, timely intervention is essential. Intravitreal gas is effective in displacement of blood, but may, may require multiple injection. anti has big role in treating the underlying pathology. Uh, TPA is effective in, in dissolution of uh, blood clot, but may not be mandatory. And the subretinal TPA is more effective and safe in refractory cases. The ultimate uh, visual prognosis depends on the underlying pathology, presence of sub-RPE blood, duration, size and the available facility. Thank you. So uh, that, uh, that come to the end, end of the uh, this session and Dr. George is not uh, with us today. Any questions from the audience and regarding any of the talks which were, uh, yes. Your talk on myopic macular traction, you said uh, you use a brilliant blue, uh, blue to stain, but uh, because of uh, posterior detachment, you use PFCL. Then so two, ta two needs, one or two uh, logic. One was uh, to prevent uh, the movement of the retina. When you're trying to peel, you need some counter traction for the retina has to be stable for the ILM to be peeled. Yes. So the PFCL helps to keep the retina flat. Sure. Second is because the macula hole is open and there is subretinal fluid, whatever you inject will go under the macula. Yes. So already because of the uh, absence of RP, the contrast is very poor. Yes. When the dye goes under the macula, when you peel, you will not be able to differentiate between the peeled area and unpeeled area. So PFC will help to prevent the accidental migration of the dye into the sub subretinal space. You first put PFCL and then you then dye. Yeah, then you uh, stain it with the soft tip cannula. Okay. So you just soft tip cannula just puts one or two drops in and around the fovea yes. so that the it doesn't go under the macula. Yes. And uh, for spades procedure, I did in one case. 
and after four months the fluid totally resolved. Okay. In, uh, Maybe I case. did in two cases and it not help. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Thank you. Sachin, hi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hi. Um, it's regarding the subretinal TPA. Um, it's uh, extremely difficult to do it in a controlled way. The subretinal. That's what I faced. Invariably, uh, the fovea, which is the thinnermost part, it just gives way at ah. the time we're pushing. This Correct. is an invariable problem which uh, I face. Uh, well, some of it closes uh, in the post-operative period. Some of them remain open. So, so the trick is to start the injection slightly peripheral to the macula. So that the uh, the fovea just comes under the edge of the macular blub which you create. If there is too much force, it will rup rupture and create hydrogenic macular hole. So you slightly start more peripherally so that the uh, main uh, fluid does not come under the macula. It is so you can slowly, when you put air, it will sleep under the macula. So don't try to, in the first sitting itself, don't try to inflate the fovea too much. That's the point where it will give away actually. And the force of injection also is a little bit uh, important. Inject very fast, uh, the chance of... I use of uh, VFC. Ah, okay, okay. Same. So, so thank you, thank you for, the, for being here and thank the speakers as well. Thanks for uh, attending the column. I see. Thank you everybody. Thank you.